Hi everyone, welcome to Carry the Fire Ministries. Thank you for joining me. I'm Jenny Collins and today I'm going to start a, a, a series of messages um, about carrying the fire. What does it mean to carry the fire? So I'm going to do um, a series of messages to, to, um, to talk about what it means to carry the fire. And we are living in momentous times and never before has the world seemed so dangerous in so much chaos and turmoil as it does right now. And it's getting uh, worse day by day. What on earth is going on? The world as we know it has changed since about 2020 when we had the, the, uh, the COVID um, when COVID hit. And it's changed beyond description, really, how many of us would have would have thought that in even 2019, that the world would change so dramatically, so quickly. And we're not going back to business as usual. We're not going back to the way it was. There will be a great reset. And we've been told by the media that there will be a new normal. What does that mean? What does a new normal? Nor normal look like and who is advocating for this new normal and I, it sounds quite scary when we think about it who is it that's prescribing this new normal whose idea was it is there really a globalist agenda at play have the events that we've seen in the last few years where the nations have been locked down We've been told we've got to be vaccinated and we've been terrified by what our governments have told us. There's been a lot of fear mongering. Has that all been by accident? Have we been ruled by fear? Where is it all heading? Now, Bible prophecy is a fascinating subject. It's not akin to reading a good book or a good fantasy novel. It's not just the concoction of a madman's brain, as some people think. It is the word of God, and it can be relied upon entirely for what is about to come on the earth. In fact, a lot of the things that are happening now have been prophesied totally accurately in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Um, you can see biblical prophecy being played out right before our eyes. We are watching it um, every day on our TV screens and in our newspaper. Things are getting chaotic and out of control. And, you know, a lot of the things that are happening now globally, the Bible talks about. Now, I have not got time at all to go into the details of it but I have studied this out, certainly since since COVID hit in 2020. It, you know, there was a lot of people that were told, well, sorry, were, were, were led by God to, to our Bibles to see how the things that are were going on and are going on around us um, are prophesied in the Bible. And if you're watching this today and you're not a Christian, then hang on to your hats because... You know, I don't know what your thoughts are about Christians, but, you know, the Bible is the word of God. And I know, you know, you can you can look at some some Christians and they've got a skewed view of the word of God. But it's so, so important that we go and read, read on a daily basis and get to know what the word of God says, the Bible, what it says about uh, about life, about where we're heading, about who we are, about Jesus when he came. His first coming was prophesied in the Old Testament. It, and, and the accuracy of those um, those prophetic, um, the, 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 the prophecies are absolutely incredible. The accuracy is incredible. And so you have to take the word of God, the Bible, as one you yeah we can dip in and dip out and uh, but we believe that the holy spirit is the fire that we carry and the holy spirit says 
Uh, so Jesus said, I will send the Holy Spirit and he will lead you into all truth. Now, recently, there's been a lot of criticism about various translations of the Bible. But I say to those people who criticize translations of the Bible that I can't believe that God allows people to do translations from a pure heart that are that would would deceive, deceive people and at the end of the day it's not about the translations themselves it's the holy spirit that lives within us that uses that those translations and some are you know the the, the old king james bible you know some people like that and then there's the more modern message um bible called the message and the pan, the passion translation and some people like that. I personally am, you know, really blessed when I read uh, the Passion Translation. And there's been a lot of criticism around from, you know, from various people who say, oh, well, this isn't right and this isn't right. But you know what? They miss the fundamental point that the Holy Spirit lives within us. He knows our heart. And Jesus says, I will send you the Holy Spirit and he will lead you into all truth and so that is what we have to rely on as people of God that we have to rely on the Holy Spirit when we've got a question or we need to we need um you know we need to find guidance we have to rely on the Holy Spirit within to lead us into all truth now you know there may be linguistically you know some some kind of problems but I just don't believe I can't bring myself to believe that God in, in all his might, who wants to know his children, he wants his children to know us, would allow translations to be translated deceptively. And yes, I know that we all have to, you know, the Bible says you can't add to it, you can't take away from it. But I, I think I don't think that all of these people who have translated the Bible down through the centuries have... Um, have done it in in a in a bid to dece to deceive you know they would have prayed about it the holy spirit would have led them that's that's the whole point of being a christian that we have this divine connection um to the you know the holy spirit and father god and jesus and you know we we rely on them to guide our lives they know our hearts they know whether we are serious about living our christian life or not and so we if we are hungry today, if you are hungry to know God, then then reach out to him because he will be faithful. And if you want to know him with all your heart, then he will make himself known to you today. So that wasn't really what I started off saying what I've got to say. But I just just feel that, you know, um, as I say, I've, I've, I've listened to criticism of various translations and I just think they're missing the point. It's the Holy Spirit within us that will lead us into all truth. Part a third of um, the Bible is, is dedicated to prophecy. Prophecy is foretelling the events that will come on the earth. And in 2023, which is when I'm recording this, we are seeing a lot of biblical prophecy, prophecy coming to pass in the global events that are happening uh, right now and we see it on our tv screens and we read it in our newspapers and it's all over social media and we, it is really biblical prophecy coming to uh you know to pay it, it right in front of our very eyes and we as the body of christ on earth need to wake up to what is happening all around us the time of playing church is well and truly over and you know we have to listen to god uh, listen to the Holy Spirit because he's always, always talking to us. And what he's saying now is not what he was saying in the 80s or in the 90s. What worked in the 80s and the 90s and, you know, the 2000s, um, you know, won't work today because we have to we have to keep up with new technology, with how God wants to reveal himself. And it's not all about events and programs. And certainly I feel that that God is now taking us away from events and programs. And he's wanting us to individually seek him for our own 
um, destiny and are part of his plan because he has a plan. You know, the enemy has an agenda, which we're seeing, you know, rolled out in this global government that they're trying to 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 um, to bring to bring about. So but God has a plan as well. He he had a plan before the before, you know, the foundation of the world. And it's just now Satan's going, mm -hmm, I need a plan, too, because he is always, always, always trying to steal, kill and destroy, as, as Jesus said in John 10. And it's time to get serious about who we are and what we are as sons and daughters of the living God, what we carry inside of us. We need to rediscover the power of God for the time that we are living in. We cannot bury our heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening. We cannot wait for it all to go away because it's not going to go away. Darkness is rising and we need to be the light and the life to those around us. It's, it's more and more and more imperative every day that we carry this light, we carry this life, we carry the fire to combat the darkness that is rising every day around us. The time has come to get people to Jesus and Jesus to people like never before. The time is short. The world is going to get worse up until the rapture of the church, which is where Jesus takes the body of Christ to be his bride and it takes them out of the earth, which will be a catastrophic, a catastrophic event, which people will know about because millions and millions of people of Christians all over the world will disappear in the twinkling of an eye. And then it will get it, things will get even worse uh, because that that puts us into the time of what's called the, the tribulation, which is seven years of intense, intense tribulation. And with the revealing of the Antichrist. Now, I know there's various different um, thoughts about when the rapture of the church is going to happen. People, Some people think it's pre-trib. Some people think it's mid-trib. Some people think it's post-trib. And then, but you know, I'd, so I'm going to state my claim now. And we as a ministry are absolutely, we believe that, you know, in it, that the Bible says very, very clearly that it will be the Jesus will the rapture of the church will be before the tribulation. So we are very, very obviously pre-trib. That's OK. If you if you if you think something else, that's OK. It's not a salvation issue. But as a church, as a ministry, when we have studied it out and listened to loads and loads of different people who, again, have studied it out, we have come to the conclusion as a ministry that we we are we believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. OK. So having said all of that, it's our time in its our turn. The body of Christ is at a very serious junction, a juncture in history, and it's our time and it's our turn. So what are we going to do about it? A few years ago now, the Lord spoke to me in a vision one night. And as I was praying, I just went into this vision and I saw a chrysalis before me. And as I watched, it started to crack open. But what emerged was not a butterfly, as you would expect, but a great shaft of white light. And it shot upwards. And almost audibly, I heard the Lord say, if my people knew what they held inside, they would change the world. If my people knew what they held inside, they would change the world. And so started a journey along with a few close friends to find out what it really is that we hold inside of us as sons and daughters of God, as the body of Christ in the earth and as Jesus beloved bride. So come with me <clears throat> as I start to unpack this, because it's going to be exciting. Are you ready? <coughs> Now, in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, we read the story of Abraham, the patriarch of Judaism and Christianity. And God called him to leave his country and go to a land that God would show him. He promised to make Abraham's descendants into a great nation. 
and all the families on the earth would be blessed through him. But there was a problem. You see, Abraham and his wife, Sarah, couldn't have children. They'd not been giving, given any children despite long years of praying and seeking the Lord. It just hadn't happened. And when we read the story, they are well past childbearing age. You can read the story for yourself and it starts in Genesis 12. So forward some years later and God had fulfilled his promise to Abraham. He was given a son. Miraculous. You know, you can read the story that, you know, they were well past childbearing age. But then God, in his mercy, gave them a son. And, it, you know, as I say, it was quite miraculous. So Abraham had seen God's faithfulness time and time again. And then in Genesis 22, we read that God speaks to Abraham again and asks him to sacrifice Isaac as a burnt offering. So Genesis 22 verses 1 to 2, it says, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. So here was Abraham. He'd waited years and years and years for a son, which he was finally given. And then God says to him, I want you to take him as a burnt offering. And I can just imagine Abraham saying, excuse me, did I hear that right? After all you've got me through to get my son, you now might want him, me to sacrifice him. And I bet Abraham struggled a lot with that one. I bet he really kind of, you know, questioned himself. Did I hear that right? Oh, I bet there was a lot of struggle with that one. And are you struggling with something in your Christian life? Because as we all know, and we've probably all experienced, Christ our Christian life is not a walk in the park. You know, we do, we, you know, we, we, God allows trials to come into our lives. And sometimes he can ask us to do something that we just go, why would you ask me to do that? But, you know, after seeing the faithfulness of God once, Abraham, this is talking about Abraham, I'm talking about Abraham now, having seen the faithfulness of God once in turning an impossibility into a possibility, Abraham makes the decision to obey God and go. No matter how ridiculous he thinks that it is and how much he really, really struggles to, you know, to sacrifice his own son. You know, he, he he makes the choice to obey God and go. And if you are struggling with something that you feel that God has said to you or asked of you, I would just encourage you to go ahead and obey, even if it just seems quite ridiculous and quite off the wall. Follow Abraham's example and just obey God because he knows what he's doing. He knew what he was doing when he made Abraham and Sarah wait for so many years, he knew what he was doing. Because our faith in God is tested. Faith is tested to prove that we, you know, that, that we have a faith. It's tested. God tests our relationship with him and how much we want a relationship with him. Because his relationship with us is so, so precious. And, um, you know, and so sometimes trials come and tests come. Trials and tests are actually quite separate. But tests are so different, I think, from trials. And sometimes he does test our faith. I've had loads and loads of tests, failed lots and lots of tests. But, you know, if, if we fail one test, God just brings it around again until we pass it. He's so, so gracious. That, um, you know, and we grow and we mature in our tests. So it's not for nothing that you go through tests. And it wasn't for nothing that Abraham, Abraham's faith was tested. Anyway, back to the story. Abraham takes Isaac and his servants until he sees the mountain in the distance. And he says to his servants, stay here. And then he takes Isaac on alone with him. And notice, notice if you read the, the account that I'm talking about, Notice how Abraham says to these servants, 
we will worship there and then we will come right back. Now, that in itself is a declaration of faith. And this is important. Abraham couldn't have made that decision lightly. And I think he would have really been consumed with doubt and sorrow. But he doesn't say that. He speaks words of faith. We will come right back. And there's a verse in Proverbs that I want to share with you. And it says, Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue can bring death or life. And those who talk will reap the consequences. And it is really, really important that you don't speak doubt. You speak faith. You Abraham knew what God had said, even though his feelings were screaming the opposite. But he chose to declare his faith. We will be we will go up to the mountain and we will come right back. So if you're in a place where you're really in doubt and you're doubting the words of God, then declare out loud your your um, your words of faith. So God will hear it. The demonic realm will hear it. So they won't be, be able to get involved because you are saying, I believe God as Abraham believed God. And it was, you know, it, it, it was credited to him as righteousness which is which is another another uh, subject entirely. But he spoke words of life because he believed the promises that God had given him. God had said he would be the father of many nations. And to do that, he needed a son. So Abraham believed that whether Isaac or died or was and was brought back to life or it happened some other way, he believed he would have his son back because he was the son of promise. You know, like I say, Abraham and Sarah had gone through years of barrenness, you know, after God had already said, you will be a father of many nations. So he hung on to that. And God may have said something to you that at the moment seems completely impossible. But do not, um, do not doubt the words that God said to you in the dark, what he said to you in the light. So let's just move on. Abraham is our example. Our, our words are, you know, as I say, our words are important because they affect how we think. If you choose only to see the worst case scenario of a situation, then that's probably what will happen. It's called self-fulfilling prophecy. And we've all been there. We've all done that. The children of Israel, you know, descendants of Isaac, uh, you know, mo moaned in the desert. And that led some of them to not get not to not go to the promised land. We have to be careful what we say over ourselves and what we believe over ourselves and say, speak over others. Now, getting back to the story, in verse six, it says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. A seemingly insignificant phrase, Abraham carried the fire, isn't it? And, you know, I've read it many times and probably just skipped over it. But it's actually the most significant part of the story, because by carrying the fire, Abraham showed God his obedience. Because without the fire, Abraham couldn't light the fire for the sacrifice, could he? The very act of carrying the fire became the action that would change his life and change history. By carrying the fire, God was saying, Abraham was saying to God, your will be done, not mine. He showed that he trusted God and was willing to give his life to God to be used for his purposes. Are we willing to carry the fire of the Holy Spirit and lay down our life for God to use in whatever way he wants? He's got a great plan for each individual life. He's got a plan for your life. He's got a plan for my life. But we have to we have to um, walk in that plan. We have to align ourselves with that plan. And, you know, sometimes the Christian life can be incredibly scary when God is asking you to do something that you go, ah, what's the point? Why? why? You can't understand why God's asking you to do something. But we take Abraham as our example. And we obey and we do it. However, our feelings are, it's declaring words of faith. 
God wants a people who will do what he wants them to do in these last days, to be totally led by the Holy Spirit day in and day out forever for, you know, the rest of our lives. God's looking for a people who will commit themselves to his plan, who will deny ourselves and, you know, so that the Holy Spirit can work through us. If it was true at the start of the great salvation plan, then it's still true today as we come to the end. We must trust God for everything and in everything. That one act of Abraham's put into motion God's salvation plan for all of mankind. And you know the rest of the story. When the ordeal is over for Abraham, God reassures him that the promise is still in place. And notice that verses 15 to 18 of Genesis 22, I love these, these verses, they're just incredible. They are parenthesized by the words, because you have obeyed me. And it says, then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says, because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son. I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed all because you have obeyed me. Wow. I love that. All because you have obeyed me. Wow. Wow. That is absolutely incredible. And so to carry the fire of God in our lives, we must trust God and we must obey him. We must be baptized in the Holy Spirit so that he can fully take control. Because if we're in control of our lives and we're on the throne, then he can't, he doesn't get a look in. You know, Jesus says, you know, we must deny ourselves, take up our cross on a daily basis and follow him. And to follow his plan for your life, you've got to let him take control. That's what we are. That's who he that's what that's what it means to carry the fire, to let him take control. And it is so, so liberating, so good. Because if we do what he says, he can then do mighty things through us. The world will be touched. The world will be led to Jesus. If we only will deny ourselves, die to ourselves, and let him take control. Let him, uh, you know, be the, the one who controls our life and our, our circumstances. Because when you've got the, the Holy Spirit within you, you're carrying the fire of the Holy Spirit, then God can do incredible, incredible things things. So join me next time as we continue this journey into what it means to carry the fire. Have a great day. Thanks.